Hello, welcome back to another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm your host, Stephen Roy Goodman. I'm here at the University of Cape Town, where we're going to be talking about classical music and opera in South Africa. Bongani Tembe is Chief Executive and Artistic Director of the KwaZulu-Natal Philharmonic Orchestra. Angelo Gabato is former director of the UCT Opera School. And Mateto Mapoyi is an aspiring opera singer. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Steve. Well, thank you for coming on. And uh, maybe, Bongani, if we can start with you. You, you flew in from Durban uh, this morning to join us. Can you say a word or two about the Philharmonic in KwaZulu-Natal? Yes, the Guazulu Natal Philharmonic Orchestra has been um, running since October 1983. So it's one of the um, longest orchestras in South Africa in this new era. And um, it's got more than 23 nationalities from around the world. And Angelo, you used to work and spend every day here at the University of Cape Town, if I'm not mistaken. I used to share the day between the University of Cape Town and uh, now Artscape and what was then the Nico Milan because I had the double pleasure of being the CEO of Cape Town Opera, formerly Cape Ab Opera, and to be the head of the opera school as well. And Mateto, I first saw you in a movie called The Creators. Uh, you were a young singer who uh, loved opera. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say a word or two about your background? Yeah, I'm a self-taught opera singer. You know, my mom was a singer as well, but uh, she never took it seriously, you know, but she was in the local choirs. So I started by listening to her CDs, you know, imitating every time she listened. And then I realized that I've got the voice for this music. And yeah, I started basking and stuff. And 2003, we did the first documentary, which was um, uh, Being Pavarotti. That's where I uh, was inspired by a friend of mine, um, Elton, who met Angelo Gubato. So when we watched the documentary, like how he was um, mentoring um, Elton, in, um, 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 giving him some advices, showing him how to sing, you know, that uh, gave me so much love for what I do and made me carry on. And then I find myself working at Cape Town Opera at some, at some stage. And that's where uh, actually got a chance to be part of an opera which was um, Manon, Ricoletto and the Taube Flete and I was lacking with the theory of music so that's where I was like okay the next step now is to find a place where I can learn theory of music luckily I got it in Pretoria it's called Gauteng Opera it used to be called Black Town Ensemble so I was there for two and a half years so we only did one opera there, which was Cozy Fan Tutti, but the experience that I got there was fantastic. And um, I got to learn about the history of opera, of opera. got to learn how to um, play around a piano, like figure out how to warm your voice on the piano and actually learn mini steps as well. And, and yeah, um, nice, nice, it was very nice to be there. Unfortunately, it got terminated at the time I was there. I had to come back to Cape Town. And then um, my first day job I got was working as a waiter. And then um, after a while, I was like, no, man, this is taking me away from what I love. So I started to concentrate on my singing again. Yeah. Fair enough. And speaking of concentrating on singing, if I can ask you two gentlemen, how, how do you mentor young singers and young performers? How do you take somebody like Mateto or somebody else and, 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 and kind of incorporate them into the work that you're doing? Angelo. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, shall we say formally, because uh, I'm fully retired now, so now I don't have the onus or the pleasure and the privilege of listening to young singers and uh, having to guide them and advise them. It's an onerous task. Uh, one has to audition young singers. Uh, one has to make up one's mind whether the instrument that the dear Lord has given them is an instrument that will be able to develop into this crazy form of opera which is a very complex form because it doesn't only combine uh, words with music. In other words, you sing. You've got to sing in many different languages. 
uh, these languages are traditionally the Italian, the German and the French Fach, but these days there is a lot of Russian opera that is being sung and uh, there, there are various other opera languages and of course one hopes that uh, there will be African languages in opera as well. Um, the language is one big problem so you've got to gauge whether the intelligence is allied to the vocal gift because uh, unfortunately it is not enough to have a beautiful voice you've mm. got to have a mind which can absorb uh, technical problems uh, you've also got to be able to look good and move well and these days where so much opera is uh, televised and uh, put on television uh, the days of the traditional rather large overweight opera singers have gone and opera singers are supposed to make drama as well and to look lovely and be able to move as well when somebody comes with stars in their eyes and tells you I want to be trained uh, it's a huge task to decide do you advise them to do that or do you advise them to do something else? They could land up directing opera. They could land up designing opera. They could land up uh, being an agent and making money by helping other people sing opera. So it's a complex task and uh, one that is very gratifying to be involved with, I must say. One would probably say that about the Philharmonic as well. Yes, um, also just to say, I'm also involved with the Johannesburg Philharmonic Orchestra. I must give them a, a little bit of, of credit. Yes, in terms of orchestral music, we identify young people and um, uh, then bring them to Deben, for instance. We've started a national cadetship program where we have a mentor in the orchestra working with a, um, a, a young um, orchestral player, somebody typically who has graduated, but there is a gap between graduation and actually making it in terms of a career. And we groom them for a couple of years uh, such that they can audition uh, for uh, um, an orchestra anywhere in the world. I'm delighted that uh, to say we've produced more than 50 young people who have now gained full employment in orchestras around South Africa and some uh, in Europe as well. So mm. speaking of that, so let's just say, let's assume I played the flute. Yes. Um, and let's assume I was okay at it. How would you, what would my path be to work with you either in Durban or in Johannesburg? You know, you'd have, of course, to go to university first or have a private teacher and we typically will um, interact with people around the age of 18, 20, 21. And um, we audition them, there's a panel. And if they show serious promise, and then we take them on into, into the program, the National Cadetship Program. Yes. And would they be paid during that or get a stipend of some sort so they could live while they were training? Yes, we give them a stipend a month, currently about 10,000 South African rands. In fact, I think 12 by now a housing allowance, and uh, we pay their teacher to teach them once or twice a week. And uh, we generally expose them to orchestral music. Uh, five years ago, I started a program with the Royal Concert Gebouw Orchestra from Amsterdam. So uh, those that are ex extremely talented, about three to five, uh, we take them to Amsterdam for a week to work with the Royal Concert Gebouw. And the, the, the musicians from the uh, uh, Royal Concert Gebouw also come to South Africa every two years. So we've got relationships with orchestras now around the world and different artists to just excite them, expose them to a higher standard. Because if people are not exposed to a very good standard, how would they know, um, you know uh, how to work towards that standard? So that's very important as well. And I assume then you must do something in the schools as well to kind of reach out to very, very young people. Yes. Before I, I get to that, the, the, the reason I, I um, started the National Cadetship Program in about 1997 was because in uh, South African universities and colleges, unfortunately, you don't have 
a sufficient number of musicians with all the relevant instruments such that you can have an orchestra. You know, I was lucky to study at the Juilliard School in New York with two orchestras. Indiana University has got four orchestras. So whilst people are doing their bachelor's, uh, BMAS, they are also every week they have to play in an orchestra. So after four years, they understand how it is to be a professional in an orchestra. They, they've <coughs> gone through repertoire. Now in South Africa, in a university, you may have 11 violinists, one flautist, no bassoon, one clarinet. So it's difficult to have a fully fledged orchestra. So they get individual tuition from their teachers, which is often good. They get theory and other things, but they don't get to experience how to be an orchestral musician. So this program was meant to close that gap and expose them to the repertoire. Uh, uh, and um, it's been working very well. Well, to that point, I mean, maybe I can open this up to everybody. So let's say I was a first year student here at the University of Cape Town and I had some ability. Could I study psychology, let's say, and do some music or I would have to just focus on music? Well, it's, it's uh, normally you have to focus on music, but um, they offer other subjects. You know, you could always take um, a course in psychology and uh, in any other subject, but your focus will have to be, will have to be music. And not to say that the University of Cape Town is inherently different than the University of the Western Cape or Stellenbosch or any other university, but are you saying that not every university in South Africa has the resources to train students musically while they're here as undergraduates? Yes, uh, not everyone. In fact, these days there are very, very few um, that can do it. You mentioned Stellenbosch and uh, UCT, University of Cape Town, um, University of Guazulu Natal, where I come from, and um, University of Pretoria, maybe Pochefstroom a little bit. So very few universities, yes. And Mateto, so let's assume that you didn't have the tuition, the money to pay the tuition at one of the universities that Bongani just mentioned. Well, as I'm talking now, I haven't had voice training since 2014, and which is a serious problem for me because um, I tend, even sometimes when I sing, I can hear myself that I uh, tend to lose, you know, the proper way of singing. Because um, when you sing opera, it's not like you're singing R&B, you're singing um, hip hop or whatever sort of music you do, you, you like. It's, 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 there must be a technique, you know, and you must master it, you know, and you need a voice trainer. You need somebody to, 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 to tell you when you're singing wrong, you know, because, um, there's there's lots of of energy that you you use when you're singing opera music. You know um, some operas I can't even see, uh, you can't even sing um, arias from it because um, you must know your voice type. You know you must know if you a uh, leggero singer these are the operas you sing. You are a spinto singer these are the operas you should sing. You know a lyric tenor these are the uh, operas you should sing and so do the composers. These are the composers you should listen to. I grew up singing like, at age of nine years, I've already sang Nesun Dorma, which is very bad for me, very, very bad for my voice. I didn't know that, I just liked the music. I learned the song, self-taught, listen to the song, pause, write down what I hear in my own language until I finish, uh, I finish writing the song. Then I'll sing the song. I'll stand right there with my beanie, I'll start singing, and then people will put money there, and then, you know, of course, um, people from my color will laugh, you know, most especially people at my age will laugh because of they don't understand what I'm singing about and some don't even have guts to stand in front of a restaurant or in front of, in front of many people and start singing, you know. So these are the challenges that um, you get as a, as a, as a person that, um, who doesn't have guidance, you know, like you tend to do things on your own and you don't know if you're right or wrong, you know, and at the end of the day, you damaged your voice, 
you know. So I'm very lucky that I still have my voice and I did get a little bit of training. So I still use those skills, you know, but it's not enough, you know, and um, I'm now raising my hand to shout for help, you know, because I believe that if I can have a voice trainer, I can be better than I am, you know what I mean? Fair yeah. enough. And Angelo, I think you wanted to yeah. chime in here. It's even more complex than um, Ntato has been saying because while an orchestral player plays on an instrument, uh, he may be lucky enough to play on an Amati violin or suddenly have a Stradivarius in his hands, but basically the technique he will use to actually play remains constant. Once he's been trained, it is being trained to get maximum skill for that instrument. Unfortunately, the singer is a human being and the human being ages. And so the training you get at the start of your career and the kind of role, uh, which technically is called Fach, forgive me for using the German word, uh, but the kind of roles that you can sing when you're beginning to be trained and your voice is young, are not the roles you're going to carry on singing for the rest of your life. So that you can never stop being trained, you can never stop being coached. Uh, so the best singers in the world still need another pair of years to tell them, yes, that was fine when you were 20 years old, but you're now 30 and your voice can do more or you've worn your voice out. You can't do as much as you used to uh, because when you're 50, things begin to happen, particularly to ladies' voices. Uh, after a certain period comes, uh, you can get voices that can carry on singing till they're 70. But uh, if you look at the career of great singers such as Callas, uh, she had a very brief career. She began to sing and she began to sing very important roles when she was very young. But by the time she was in her 40s, her voice had been worn down to the amount that she could hardly sing at all. Yeah. Uh, so that it is very important for young people to get the right sort of advice, but to also have somebody who can follow their career and somebody they can trust. Because a young singer can be intelligent enough to know what's good for their voice, but they can never actually stand at the back of the auditorium and listen to themselves. You can get friends to help by recording you and so on, but the trust between a singer and the personal coach uh, is very closely, I think, allied to the trust between a personal coach for a sportsman that your muscle tone keeps on changing, your age changes, and you need this advice. And to find that advice is difficult. Sometimes you go back to your original singer back at home. Mm -hmm. Other time, instead, you find the right coach uh, in an opera house overseas, and you keep on returning to that person. And other times you've got to say, well, this relationship was good while it lasted, but now I've outlived it. I need to find somebody else who can take me to the next level. And hoping that the level will be a continually increasing one, but also bearing in mind that there will come a time when you're going down the hill on the other side and you want to keep on earning good money and turning out good art. And you need even better advice as to how not to give up because your instrument is slightly worn, but to change the repertoire that you sing mm. so that you will be able to keep on lasting. Do you agree with that, Bongai? Yes, um, indeed. It's, um, our instrument is ourselves, so it's, you know, it's subject to so many things. Um, mm. it's, it, it's a gift from God, but there are just so many factors uh, that really affect it. Well, and speaking of the gifts, I believe that the two of you did a project on Robben Island together. Could you say a word or two about what that was? Yes, in 2004, to celebrate 10 years 
of democracy in South Africa. Um, the Cape Town Opera, which Angelo was leading uh, at the time, as well as the Norwegian National um, Opera Company, uh, really conceived this um, project. And uh, we did Fidelio by Beethoven on Robben Island. And the words that were used were those of um, former President Nelson Mandela. So it was moving. Mm. It was quite an experience. Uh, I think moving is one way of putting it, but the work that went into making it happen, uh, and of course the money that went into making it happen, was considerable. Uh, we had interest from the Norwegian company. Uh, they had made a lot of money because of... Uh, cracking oil off their coasts and they wanted to spend it and they wanted to spend it in helping other nations raise their culture and uh, they visited Johannesburg, they visited Durban, they visited Cape Town and when they came to us I happened to throw onto the table well would it be nice uh, to do something on Robben Island like Fidelio for example because uh, Mandela was a prisoner on Robben Island and uh, he was released from Robben Island and Fidelio is an opera that speaks about hope, that speaks about democracy, that speaks about freedom. They immediately mm. went for this and then the problem started because they guaranteed that they would be willing to help to a large amount with the funds but we had to get the trust of the ministers at the time to allow us to use Robben Island as a venue and to bring all the apparatus required onto Robben Island. And so I turned to Bongani and said, with your acquaintances with the ministers, can we not get together and persuade the powers that be that this is going to be a good thing for South Africa? Thank the dear Lord, Bongani put all the efforts out and uh, when you think of the fact that every single item used had to be carried over the sea to Robben Island, every screw had to put in a container and to be carried over the water, every mm. bottle wow. of water that we drank had to go over the water, every wow. bit of food had to go over the water, the artists had to go over the water mm. and rehearse, and you hoped that the weather would be good because there was no guarantee Cape Town weather is very changeable mm. and the dear Lord was with us the weather was absolutely fine we managed to do a performance of the opera it was fully recorded by a Norwegian television company and I think we can be very proud of the achievement that on Mandela's Island the Cape Town opera chorus was wearing the actual uniforms that the prisoners on the island had worn <laughs> and uh, this was the collaboration we got from the island. Uh, when our tailors got hold of these costumes uh, which were actual uniforms and one of them might well have been worn by Madiba himself and they started opening them up, they found them stuffed with newspaper and cardboard and anything that would just keep the cold out. Because during the day, Robben Island is beaten down with sun, it gets very, very hot. But during the night, even on good weather, it is ice cold on that island. Mm. And one can really understand what those prisoners must have got through and one can only continue to respect the fact that somebody like Mandela could understand that it was necessary to change the politics, but to do so by a democratic collaboration which led to the Rainbow Nation and which has led to a country which is still surviving despite many prophets of doom at the time. Well, speaking of the prophets of doom, I'm the prophet of doom in terms of time. We only have a few minutes left. Uh, is there anything else that 
anybody would like to say to an audience watching this, trying to get a, a better understanding of the future of classical music and opera in South Africa? I would say, um, more especially to young people, if you already started it, carry on with it. Believe in it, and, and it's your chance to shine, you know, and you're gonna make it, and if you just focus on it, and it doesn't mean don't do other stuff. You can do whatever you wanna do, but just know where, where you set your mind. It's where your eyes are at, you know, yeah. Thank you. I wanted to sing. I was singing at probably an even younger age than Tato did. And uh, I wasn't singing the Sundorba then. The Sundorba <laughs> wasn't a very well-known aria at that time. But I was trying to be Mario Lanza. Because when I was young, the great tenor was Mario Lanza. He appeared in movies like The Great Caruso. Mm -hmm. And I had a singing career uh, when I was under 13. And um, I was professional. I used to get paid for it. But then when the voice broke, my parents said, now, let's talk Turkey. What are you going to do with your life? And I decided that the best Turkey would be to study science. I rather enjoyed mathematics and chemistry and physics. And so I got a degree. I got a master's degree in science. And I kept my singing training through private channels. But when the opportunity arose for me to sing, that's what I really wanted to do. And fortunately, it was successful. So although I did a science degree, I never used it. And I've always gone from being a singer to a director to a teacher. So uh, yes, it is possible to be trained in other things and music on a full-time basis, as you were saying, at the university. And one can do medicine, one can do law, and take the music subjects as part-time subjects. And you can still succeed in a musical career. So that's another way. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Morgani, last word. Yes. Uh, when my wife and I um, started singing opera some 35 years ago, people will say, why as black people are you singing uh, opera? It, it doesn't make sense. And um, I think in the West we've mystified opera. And um, it's, it's a simple thing. In opera you choose a story, then you engage a composer, and uh, you engage singers and you make it work. So uh, it, it's really, it doesn't mean that it always have to be uh, the magic flute or Carmen. And uh, we can also do stories that reflect our heritage here in South Africa or anywhere else in the world. I'm delighted now we've done operas about Mandela, Winnie Mandela, uh, Shaga Zulu, the king of the Zulus. So really opera, uh, can be for everyone and it is meant to be that way. When it started in Italy, people used to come and just watch it and eat and throw tomatoes at their singers. So it was really something for the community. But we've just made it as if it is something for the few. So it's something that must be shared uh, with everyone. Well, thank you and thank you all for sharing your thoughts today. If you would like additional information about the show, Higher Education Today, please feel free to send an email to me at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. And thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.